All right, it was funny. Last time I said I wasn't sure why it created a table, but when I looked at the notes, the description of it, I said example change to also create a table or something like that. So apparently someone asked a question in uh, one of the earlier semesters about that example, and I added that in there. So um, at any rate, um, that, that's, what we, that's what we have here. Um, so the dictionary, the XML dictionary example in the other folder probably would do the, the drop down the same way. It just wouldn't create the table. So you could use that as an example as well. Today we're going to cover JSON. And JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And it, how do I want to say this? You don't, it's not exclusively used with JavaScript. You can use it in other contexts as, as well. It's just a notation that JavaScript uses to describe objects. And when you do that, then you can use sort of the familiar dot notation to refer to elements um, that are being returned. All right? It is a little less flexible than XML. With XML, we didn't cover the full power of XML, but with XML, you can put attributes on, just like you can put attributes in a HTML document. So I could have, for example, an employee tag with an ID and then first name and so on. So XML supports attributes on tags in addition to the tags themselves. But that being said, JavaScript object notation, JSON, is uh, pretty powerful in its own right. All right. And it can show hierarchies just like XML can, and it can show structure. And it's not as complicated as um, XML is. So as far as the, where it fits on the continuum, more complicated than a flat file, but more flexible than a flat file, not as complicated as XML, probably not as full featured as XML either. So it fits nicely in between. So we're going to look at this example. And again, we're going to look at, first of all, what the server creates, what the JSON format is for the server, and you can sort of compare that in your head to um, the XML and flat file version of this data. All right. And then we're going to look to see how it gets parsed. Remember that in this example, the dictionary example, only the first XML HTTP request is different. In other words, the last one where we give an index and we get back the translated term, that one is simple enough that it does not require anything other than simply returning the translated term as text. All right? One thing you'll notice about all these methods, we're not returning any formatting along with them. In other words, whether we do delimited, whether we do JSON or XML, we're not doing anything like, and again, this is a common mistake people do, is like, well, let's see, I want to display a table so my server-side code will return a table. No, the server is responsible for returning raw data. It's the client's job to format that however you want to. And that separation between the server providing data and the client doing the formatting, again, is another example of doing something so it's more maintainable. All right? I could actually have, potentially, several clients asking the same server script for some data and each of them formatting the data a little bit differently All right, to, to fit the needs of the particular page. All right? So if you intermingle the data with the presentation, you lose some of that flexibility. All right? So the server is simply giving back data. 
Again, it's sort of a common theme, the separation between the content and the way it's going to look. You know, we saw that in HTML versus CSS. All right? We see that in ASP.NET when we separate the presentation from, like, the business rules and the business logic and, and that sort of thing. So it's a sort of a, a continuation of that theme. By having things do just one job, one discrete job, we open up a lot of flexibility because all they have to do is that one job and then you can plug in other things to go and work with that component. All right. Um, if a component does two things, that is supplies the data and formats the data, then it's less, less flexible than a component that simply supplies the data. All right, so let's go and look at what JSON data looks like. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to type in my URL. Here's what we get. All right. Now, this is, if you look at this, and if you if you think of like things that maybe you've seen in JavaScript. You'll notice again, the curly brackets indicate like a block of things, a block of code. So the curly brackets here indicate it's a block of data. All right. You'll notice that what you have then is you have an ordered pair. Sometimes these are called associative arrays, where the array isn't an index, but the array element um, has a name instead. All right? So what you have in, in, in JSON notation is essentially this. be like 
like any other syntax there that you'd have in Java when you in JavaScript when you define data. It would it would not be able to you know, it, it wouldn't be able to parse it and you'd get some error saying that it's a null value or something like that. So in this case, my array is called name. I can refer to the elements by their subscript. In other words, this would be name sub zero. This would be name sub one. Within each array element, I could refer to the name of the attribute. So if I wanted Mike, it would look something like this. Name sub zero dot employee. All right? And that would point to Mike. Name sub one employee would point to Charlie. If I had additional fields, like if I had a, a, an employee and an email, something like that, then I would say name, sub, whatever, employee, not employee, but email, and that would give me that value. So, it's a dot notation. So, to summarize here, we have names and values. It gets muddied because those values can themselves be arrays. And those arrays can contain multiple elements. Alright, as we have here. So, let's look at our example here. And we can sort of dissect it. All right. Curly brackets again indicate containment, indicate a block of code. So everything, this is my big chunk of JSON data. Everything is in this word list array, if you look. The first thing is called, the first element is called word list. So the name of the element is word list. The value is this array. All right? With the array being indicated by the square brackets. Every curly bracket set is an element of that array. So this is element zero of that array. This is element one. <coughs> this is element two, and so on down the list. All right. In this case, this is a shorter version of it, same thing, word list is everything. It's an array that consists of, in this case, three elements. This is element sub zero, this is element sub one, and this is element sub two. Now, each of those array elements has two attributes to it. It has a word attribute and an index attribute. So if I wanted to refer to this piece of data, all right, what would the notation be for that? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, it would be wordless bracket three dot word. Um, I think you're close. So you're saying it would be wordless 
dot or three dot word. Close, what has to change with that? What do you start counting with in arrays? And, so that would be sub two, right. All right. So if we think about how we're going to parse this, let's go back to the bigger example. We have an array. We can get the length of that array. We can loop through for as many things are in that array. We can pull out the word attribute of each array element, and that will be what we put as the option, the, the, the inner HTML of the option, the, the text of the option. And the index will be what we put for the value of the option. All right. So let's look at how I create this. And how I create it is simple, right? All I have to do is take what I had before, take the flat file or the XML file, and I just have to add these extra overhead bytes, these extra overhead characters, all right? Remember, with XML, it was the tags, all right, were the overhead. The tags were describing what it is. With delimited data, the delimiters were the overhead. Those were the extra data. Here, the quotes, the curly brackets, the square brackets, those are the extra data. So all I have to do is format that output to have the proper sets of curly brackets, and so on. So if I look at the code for this, that's not what I want. I include my dictionary INC, just like I always have. I loop through, just like I always have. I initialize my list as being curly bracket, word list, colon, um, square bracket. Each word that I find that matches, I create an entry, which is the results I had before plus this stuff. And when I'm all done, I close it with the ending square bracket and ending curly bracket and print results. So essentially all I do is, you know, this, this program has pretty much stayed the same for the three methods. The only thing that we change is we change the extra characters that we output along with the data. With the delimiters, we put the colons and semicolons in. With XML, we put the XML tags that we wanted to output. With this, we put the curly brackets and other stuff that we have. Now, in terms of overhead, again, this fits nicely in the middle. There's not as much overhead with this as there is with XML, but there's mo more overhead um, than there is with a delimited file. And by overhead, I mean the extra data along with the data that gets passed. And that, like, makes sense and is poetic justice as it will because it, it only makes sense, right? The most flexible one should have the most extra bytes to it, right? Because that flexibility comes at a cost. And if with XML data, somehow there ended up being less overhead than one of these other solutions, that wouldn't seem right, that you'd get more flexibility by passing less data. Right? It seems like for more flexibility, you better be passing more data. So it makes sense in, in, in the scheme how the JSON fits in between these in terms of complexity, flexibility, amount of overhead, and so on. Questions about the server side here? 
really the only thing that's different is the the extra characters that we're outputting. We're outputting them to make sure that they fit the JSON format. Again, if you were if if I were doing this from scratch, what I would do is I'd have in my mind what the JSON format was going to look like. I would then write the server side code and output it to make sure that my code was outputting the JSON output the way I expected it to be output. All right. Then I'd start worrying about the client side. All right. On to the client side. And we notice it still works. Let's open up the HTML file. Like with XML, this is the same, right? Still using a pipeline between the two. All right. This is the same. I make the request in the same manner that I made it in the other examples. So I don't do anything different. All right. I, I make the request. The difference is, is the data that I'm getting back from the server. So, as you might expect, this function is going to be the one that's really going to be different. All right? Because I'm now getting the data back in a totally different um, format. All right. The data comes back as response text. Okay? data comes back as response text. Um, XML was the exception there. If you remember in the XML code, we, we wrote a header that indicated that we're sending back XML as opposed to plain text. Excuse me. We did not do that in this example. We didn't write the header at all. This line of code, what it does is it takes the raw string that we have and makes an object out of it. All right? Because when we return this, all we have is a string that contains this stuff. We have to tell JavaScript, hey, make an object out of this that we can use. All right? Make an object out of this that we can use. And that's exactly what this line of code does. So now response has an object, or is an object, that contains that data. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I, 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 because I'm dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Good eye, I didn't even notice that. Um, that's a nice case where it was forgiving for me. Uh, I thought it might actually be part of the code. No, no, just a mistake. All right, so now we have an option called response. And I won't say I lied to you, but I, I missed part of it because I said that you would refer to just wordless.link. I omitted the part that you have to just put the, the name of the object first that you create. So I created an object called response. So the full answer is not word list. It's whatever my object, whatever I called my object that I created, dot word list. All right? So word list, if you remember, is an array. So I can treat it just like any other JavaScript array. I can say, repeat this instruction over and over and over as long as i is less than response, that's the name of my object, word list, that is the array, all right, that belongs to that object now, the length of that. So it's going to do it. It's going to do this instruction as many times as there's elements in the array. 
That is, it's going to do it as many. How am I making my option? I'm making my option just like I did before. The difference is where I'm getting the data from. Here, I'm getting the text part of the drop-down option from response, that's my object, dot word list, that's my array, sub i, that's the particular element of the array, dot word. So if we're looking at this, this all gets put in my response object. Look in the word list array, element sub i, first time through, the value is zero. So it's going to pull the zeroth element. What part of that zeroth element do I want? I want the part that is called word. So in this case, each of these array elements themselves are sort of like an array, but they're an array that have name for values instead of subscripts. All right. So I pull the word part of that first array element, and that's the text of the option. The index part of it is the value of that option. And once I do that, I'm back in business, and everything else flows the same. Again, that second AJAX request there's really no need to change. We haven't changed that from the first example because we're simply getting back one single string of data and there's really no need to do anything but return that string of data. Now, for the final exam, what you're responsible for is understanding the um, understanding the formats and understanding the relative advantages and disadvantages of a format. I may, for example, pose a situation and say, what do you think would be the best way to send the data from the server to the client? All right? And, and, and why? I'm not going to let you get off that easy where you could just guess and have a one out of three chance, right? And the reason I'm going to ask you why is because in some cases, there might be more than one good answer. Some cases, you could make an argument for all three of them. I suppose that one would be pretty rare, but you definitely, you definitely could make an argument in some cases for one of two different possibilities. And what you say to rationalize your answer um, is, um, you know, is just as important as the answer itself. So I might ask you a question about the format um, and, and that sort of stuff. Obviously, you're not going to have a big programming example where you have to do something in JSON or XML, but you should understand these for the final. Again, the final is comprehensive in the sense that it will discuss both PHP and JavaScript and AJAX. But the focus will be on the AJAX part. So JavaScript questions will be likely questions that are related to how JavaScript is used within an AJAX context. In addition, keep in mind that one of the reasons for written tests is for me to make sure that you understand why you do certain things. Or if you're given a choice between doing something here and there, why you would do it in one place versus the other. You could code something. I could t ask you to code such and such, and you can do it perfectly. But if someone wasn't there to tell you what to code, you might not have any clue to do it this way or that way. So part of the test is for me to understand, uh, me, me to assess how well you understand, um, gee, this is how you do such and such, but this is why I did it this way as opposed to that way. Even getting fundamentally back to, um, like, why we would do something in JavaScript versus um, do it via server-side code. So for the most part, the questions will be conceptual, 
The focus will be on Ajax. I can't promise that I won't ask questions just plain about JavaScript or PHP, but the focus will be on the Ajax part of it. Other questions? If you have questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, I don't really have a schedule for next week, but if you need assistance with anything, I can be here. Um, you know, I can arrange something uh, to be here. All right. Let's go to lab.